Oi, oi, and welcome to the Orient Outlook podcast, sponsored by Carol Angley Flores with myself, Steve Nussbaum. And this week, with the bearded legend, Mr. Levy away, we've got another one of our South Stand chums to join me. So welcome back to the Orient Outlook podcast towers for the first time since late 2019. It's the one and only Mr. Chris Kane. Chris, welcome back. Thank you for having me. Thanks for having me. Yeah, looking forward to it. It's been a while, right? A few years, yeah. I think the last one was with Nigel Travis and Dave and Nigel's son. So a lot has happened in that time. A lot has happened. We were just reminiscing that that was just after we got promoted from the National League and we're just a newly uh, transformed League to club. And as we sit here five and a half years later, I think doing the maths, we are yeah. now a solid League One club. Lots, I guess, to catch up on. I guess to start off this season, depending on how you look at it, I think some people think it's been a great season. Others think it's been a wasted opportunity. What are your thoughts on it? How do you think the season's gone for the O's? I think we've done well. I think you, you look at how we did last year and that's at a good base. And now this year was always, I think even Nigel must have said it, or Kent, one of the, one of the two, said, let's consolidate. And I think we've done more than that. We're well into the mid-table. Flirted with the playoffs at one point. But without the injuries, I do think it's a case of what might have been. As much as how well we've done, we could have done even better. Yeah, I think that's absolutely fair. I think when you were last on, and again, we were just saying that it was just after we lost Justin. Yes. Uh, and since that point, there have been a few Orient managers, some well-received, some not as well-received. Obviously, you've not been on the podcast since Richie Wellens has been in charge now, which has been just over two years. What are your thoughts on um, Richie's performance since he joined the club? I don't think you can say anything else other than positive stuff. He's when We were only going one way when he came in. And that was looking at the National League again. But he's come in. We've won the league the next year. We've gone up a league. We've improved across the board as a club. So there's nothing else other than positivity you can say about him. He's got standards. He wants them met. And yeah, he's he's done everything that he can do to meet them. You can't ask for more. He certainly has. We love Super Richie Wellens here on Outlook podcast tower so I guess on the pitch there's been quite a few uh, stand up players this season who's called you alright Chris anyone who you've been really impressed with this season on the pitch Ruel's done really well to to score the amount of goals that he has he's been a little bit inconsistent at times where you look at some of the things he's done you think okay you could have shot sooner or you could have passed but he's still scored 11-12 goals in a completely new division for him that he's never played in before so fair play but what a sign in Ollie O'Neill's been you can't you can't look past the impact he's had you'd have thought Dan Adji would have had that, that sort of impact as well but if you're looking for consistency Jordan Brown all day long doesn't make many mistakes at all probably doesn't get noticed as much <laughs> as he would want to either because of just going about his business but you can't you can't say anything other than positive things about Jordan. So if the season ended today, he would be... I mean, we've only got two games, but... <laughs> but yeah, for me, he's my player of the season. And I'm sure a few people around, that sit around me, <laughs> Guy Warren, don't necessarily agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think he's been... I think he's been really, really consistent, played really well. And he's been... done what we needed him to do. Filled in where we needed. So yeah, Jordan for me has stood out massively. Been a lot of praise for Ethan Galbraith recently as well. Fully justified, fully justified. And I think next year is going to be even better for him. Mm. He's had the year now to to come in, find his feet, which he did very quickly. I think now, as much as it's good for him to be playing every week, it needs to be in the same position then he will improve even more. Right back, possibly. But as we saw yesterday, he he, do, he does jump into challenges a little bit. But centre midfield, for me, that would be where we where we would use him, utilise him the best. And he can score. Mm-hmm. He certainly can. All right. Most games this season, Chris, when we've been in the South Stand, you've been behind us. We've seen some 
great goals, some entertaining matches. Do you have any stand-up games this season? I think if you're looking at the opposition, if you're looking at where we need to be to get out of it, which has to be an ambition, you've got to look at Portsmouth, Derby. They tore us apart early on in the season. And that really was a bit of a baptism of fire to have them, Charlton, Wickham, Blackpool, all within the space of about six, seven weeks. But f- looking at our performance, Cambridge, that 2 0 win with a team of the average age of about 21, 22, to put in the shift that they all did and look comfortable. I mean, Cambridge were top of the league at the time. That's my game, my game of the season currently. Hopefully next week will be a little bit different and we can beat Fleetwood 6 0. But, but yeah. <laughs> I hold you to that one. All right, I guess last question in your kind of reintroduction to the pod. There's going to be a lot of talk in the next couple of weeks about the summer and how the club will improve um, for next season. In your views, then, Mr Kane, what do we need to do in the summer, I guess, to, to finish better than the 10th place we look like we're going to finish in League One this season? I think bringing in another goal scorer. Ruel scoring 12 or 13 is, is brilliant. However, you look then our next best players scored eight or nine. So at least we we are scoring goals, but we need mm. we need someone that can put away the half chances that we can get. So and a good goal scorer, which every club wants one. So it's not going to be easy. Mm. Um, but I think nail, as well nailing down a goalkeeper. Bryn's done brilliantly up to now. He's made a few mistakes, but having a goalkeeper on a permanent basis rather than unknown, I think definitely solidifies the defence as well because they know who they're playing with for mm. uh, the whole season rather than possibly losing the goalkeeper midway through the season because of injuries at their parent club, as we thought might happen at Middlesbrough. Yeah, OK. Good point, Steph and Chris. Chris is here for the entire episode and we welcome him back to the Towers of the Orient Outlook. All right, so we always do a sponsorship update at this point in the pod. So we are proudly sponsored by Carol Angley Florist. They're florists obviously based in Chinkford and have served the borough of Waltham Florist and the surrounding area for over the last 70 years. They've got a fantastic team there, can do anything that you need them for, bespoke weddings, family funerals, birthdays, anniversaries, bat mitzvahs, bar mitzvahs, christenings, you name it, they can do it for you and they offer all those fans and staff 15% off which is a great discount for you out there. So you can get in touch with John and the team by calling the shop on 0208 529 4130 or you can go to their website and find them at www.carolangley.co.uk or if you're on social media, you can find the team on all the platforms that you would expect them to be on. They're on Instagram at Carol Langley Florist. They're on Twitter at Carol Langley E4. They're on Facebook at Carol Langley Florist. And I guess a bit of a shout out that next season brings some new opportunities in terms of sponsoring the Orient Outlook podcast. So if you've got a business or a product to promote and you're an Orient fan and you think we can help you, then get in touch, give us an email or give us a DM on any of our socials. I would love to hear from you. So Mr. Cam, we've got one trip left to go to in two weeks before the season ends. Do you want to give us an update on the supporters club? Yes, so the final game of the season is away at Shrewsbury Town. And coaches, if you would like to book, will be leaving the supporters club at 9 a.m., because kickoff for some reason is at twelve thirty. <laughs> uh, adult tickets for the coach will cost thirty seven pound. Concessions at thirty four, and if you are lucky enough to be under sixteen, <laughs> they cost nineteen pound. If you are not a member of the sports club, though, however, you have to pay a three pound non member surcharge. And please remember, that's not a ticket involved as well. You have to buy your ticket. So to book for this, you can contact the supporters club on the travel line on oh seven five zero seven. Five three nine five seven nine. I'm sure you can find them on social media as well if if you need to. And they can Karen and the team there are more than happy to help you out in whatever way they can. Great team. Also, supporters club, star man. I think there might be a few tickets still available for left. That's two weeks this evening on the twenty eighth of April April at the Prince Regent. I'll be there. Mr. Kane will be there as well on the Orient Outlook podcast table. It's gonna be a great night. So if you're still umming and ahhing do yourself a favour, get yourself down there. It's always good fun, always good interaction with some of the squad and the management and you get to meet fellow Orient fans and have a great evening in the process. That's two weeks tonight, £75. And again, going to the supporters club against Fleetwood Town, pre or post-match, 
go and register your interest and I'm sure you can probably get yourself a ticket for that one. All right, before we go through the week that was just one piece of AOB this week, so I'll say a shout out to Orient Dan 22 and to Alfie, who I met on the way to the Exeter City game on Tuesday night. Great talking to you about the club and about the podcast. Hope you had a great uh, experience of going to Derby. The two young men were off to Derby on the Supports Club coach. Obviously not the result we wanted, which we'll speak about, but I hope you had a great experience going to Pride Park nonetheless. So let's move on into the week that was starting with Happy Monday, the 8th of April. And it was the anniversary of taking on Arsenal in the FA Cup semi-final all the way back in 1978, 46 years ago. That's a good, good piece maths, of mathematics yeah. just off the top of my head there. You ever imagine Orient getting to an FA Cup semi-final against that? I mean, obviously we weren't both days. around in 78, yeah. but what a trip that must have been. Yeah, that would have been an, an incredible day out. And I know a few of the people that we sit around were there on, on that day. And I think you, you can only look at, at that with a tinge of jealousy now. Yeah. Because <laughs> unfortunately, in the current time, it, it, it won't happen. It might do in the future, should we carry on building. But... Mm. The stronger clubs are just too strong these days, unfortunately. And we don't get a look in much unless you get get really, really lucky. Unless you're you not get, can't draw. Yeah, yeah. you're not gonna get much past round four or round five. I mean you never I guess the beauty of football is you never know, right? But very unlikely, but it'd be amazing to even have a cup run. I think you know, Nigel Travis has spoken about it quite a lot, I think, this season. We went out in the second round, didn't we? Uh, away at Chesterfield yeah. with the opportunity to go away to Watford. Looming, which yeah. obviously we didn't take. I think the, the closest I can remember having a big cup tie since the podcast started anyway was when we went to Scunthorpe with the chance of yes. going away to Stanford yeah. Bridge. That was the last one that really got the blood raised and then obviously yeah. went to Scunthorpe and um, lost 3-0 unfortunately if I remember that rightly. It was something like that, yeah. I mean, I, I went up I mainly because it, it was a free coach. <laughs> so, uh, so I went up and with all the hope of the world but didn't happen. And even last year or two years ago against Stoke, we could have beaten them as That's well. Right. Paul, Paul Smith ran yes. the show and Harry Smith had a chance and Aaron Drinnan might have had a chance as well. So it's not like we we can't beat these big teams. It's just when it gets to the bigger teams that I think we might unfortunately come on come undone. Yeah, good point. All right. Also on Monday, Ralph Satui was named in the official League One team of the day. And Ethan Galbraith was named in the Football League Papers League one team today following their performances against Cheltenham Town. So well done to both of those chaps. Could have been a few more names in there. Good performances for both of them against Cheltenham, which we spoke about in last week's podcast. So let's move on into Tahue Tuesday, which was the 9th of April. Yes, that was Exeter at home. night A night game, although, as I was saying before the game, it was... I can't remember any other game that we've had on a Tuesday night where it's been light at kickoff. <laughs> Fair play. Uh, it was a, uh, it was quite nice. Felt almost pre-seasony. Yeah. And at times, it did feel a bit like a, a bit like a pre-season, pre-season performance. But the team at the start was Sol Brinning goal, Rob Hunt, Omar Beckles, Jack Simpson, and Jaden Sweeney at the back. Jordan Brown, Ethan Galbraith, Max Sanders in midfield with Oli O'Neill, Ruel Sotiru and Joe Piggott up top. Subs were Sam Howes, Tom James, Brandon Cooper, Zach Abirio, George Moncur, Dan Adji and Kayon Edwards. All right, so that starting 11 meant that Richie Wellens made five changes to the team that started against Cheltenham Town the previous Saturday. His former Orient Loney, Tom Carroll, started for the visitors. So when I saw that team at 6.45, I mean, there weren't many surprises for me there. But another big chance for Sweeney, I think. Richie is on the fence with Sweeney. I've got to be honest. We think he's done well, uh, and I kind of alluded to that in previous episodes. I've got a feeling Richie isn't so sure on Sweeney because one week he's starting, and the next week he's out of the squad entirely. Um, and I also thought Zek might consider himself a little unlucky not to be starting that game following his strong performance against Cheltenham. Although Richie did say he wanted to chill up and change a little bit, so I understood that one. Um, Strong options off the bench. So you look at that bench, you go James can do a job, Kupu can do a job, Moncur and Adji can do a job, and Oberia obviously coming off that form to get Charlton can do a job. So look at that bench, and actually, that's a pretty strong bench there. So not many surprises there for me when I saw that lineup. What about yourself? No, likewise. I think Zek was, I thought, very unlucky considering he put in the man of the match yeah. performance. However, at the same time, he's still very young still very raw and it's probably the best way to manage him going forward so we don't have 
any more injuries. Uh, Sweeney being left out completely was a bit of a surprise. There might have been something more in that in terms of fatigue or injury. Um, but also George Monker has played really well of late. So for someone who thrives off confidence, I thought it would have been a bit more logical to put him in from the start. But yeah, I think you can quite easily pick holes in, in every team yeah, of that, course. That, that starts. You go, the football's a game of opinions and... Absolutely. Everyone's got a wrong opinion. Everyone's got a right opinion, depending on who you talk to. Absolutely. They do have. We had a few opinions come into us at <coughs> Orient Outlook Podcast Towers when that team was announced. Jeff Moss, 195292. So Piggott hasn't done enough already and will be on his way. Abirio, not starting again. It's disappointing after his performance on Saturday. Yeah. At Patrick G321 said, It's a strong lineup. Probably a stretch for Abirio to start two games in the space of four days. Need to ease him in gently. Good opportunity to get Piggott in the shop window and to take a closer look at Simpson. I fancy another easy win. That's a good point there about Zek. You know, it is a big ask to start a youngster. So maybe that's what Richie's thinking there and alludes to that. Well, I, Patrick, never expect another easy... Never expect a win when you go into the Orient. To expect an easy win is just pure madness. Um, but there you go. All right, so the last Tuesday night game of the season kicked off in a chilly Brisbane road with the O's nine points behind six place Oxford United with four games remaining, which meant mathematically we could still make the playoffs. I mean, that even that stat in itself, although highly unlikely, is still a huge achievement, I think, for the club in their first season back with four games left to mathematically still being with a chance. Yeah, I think mentally, psychologically, we were all thinking... Playoffs is done. Yeah. However, yeah, of course, stranger things in the world have happened. Absolutely, and we could have we could have done it, but it wasn't to be in the end. Absolutely, don't forget we are we're up against an informed Exeter side who are on a decent unbeaten run. I think it's their best unbeaten run in a good good couple of years. So it's always going to be a difficult game. So Exeter seemed to start slightly sharper. Won the first corner of the game in the fifth minute, but that came to nothing. Yeah, Ruel then went down in the twelfth minute, clutching his hamstring. Unfortunately, he couldn't continue and Mr. Abirio came on to replace him. So we all got our wish of <laughs> seeing him for <laughs> yeah, pretty just, much the whole game. Just 12 minutes in. Shame there for real. I think Richie's been quite vocal about the amount of football that's been played this season is leading to more injuries. And obviously, I think we're all used to like three or four minutes injury time in half. It's normally being played. Yeah. And this year, we've seen six minutes, seven minutes, eight minutes. Combine that in the first half of games and the second half of games, times that by 40. And that's a lot more minutes that these footballers are playing in very quick succession. Yeah, and at the start of the season, it was even more than that. Yeah. Coming off the back of, was it the World Cup? And that was just crazy. you getting 10 minutes of injury time for just because the ball's gone out of play for a throw-in. Yeah, it absolutely was. All right, we're going to skip to the 32nd minute. There's not much was happening. Lots of possession-based football without many chances being created. In the 32nd minute, though, the dangerous ranking on the right-hand side of Exeter beat Jaden Sweeney on our left. He put in a low cross it was met by the oncoming Richards who side-footed the ball into the side netting there. So a bit of a laugh there, but nothing for Solbring to actually do there. No, thankfully. But then three minutes later, we took the lead in quite amazing fashion as an Ollie O'Neill corner from the left was whipped in, beating Sinisalo and flying into the far end of the net to give the, one, give the O's a 1-0 lead directly from a corner, which I think I've been to quite a few live games, but I've never seen a goal directly from a corner. Whether he meant it or not, he, Ollie, Ollie will say he did, and we agree with you, Ollie. But no, I mean, <coughs> great corner. So for this game, my daughter was a flag bearer that I mentioned in last week's podcast. So normally I'd be in the south stand and have a really clear view of that corner, yeah. which would have been great to see, as you probably did. I yep. was in the east stand, so at the time I was like, "Did he just was that a goal direct from the corner?" And then obviously uh, Barry Galvin announced that it was direct from the corner. Great corner. Mentioned Ollie O'Neill massively last week. Had a bit of a, a discussion with Paul. I think Ollie O'Neill was championship ready. Personally, yeah. based on what I've seen, Paul didn't. I just think that's another one for his scrapbook already. I mean, he's only been here since January. I mean, that's, again, it's something that you come to expect almost from Ollie O'Neill scoring unlikely goals. I haven't seen an Orient player score a corner, I don't think, ever. So, very pleasantly surprised. Well done, Ollie. Great to give us a lead. Yeah, I th- He's come in, hit the ground running straight away from a player that, when we signed him, everyone was going, oh, okay, who's this guy? Yeah. And without any disrespect to, to Oli at all, you don't, you don't normally expect someone to come in from a, an under-23s team and 
hit the ground going as quickly as he has and he scored what half a dozen done very well I know most of his goals have been good goals as well well taken Paul made a point of saying Ollie having his own goal of the month contest well, obviously he oh, scored yeah. the previous Saturday against Charlton Town with the one touch and the curl into the far corner he's obviously going to get you know, his <coughs> goal of the month with the goal he scored directly from a corner yeah. there's some good goals it's lovely to see good goals being scored at Orient again yeah I mean the Cheltenham game was a bit of a freak in the fact that we scored three incredible <laughs> goals, goals yeah. I mean we didn't look like we created much else other than those but I mean, he could also similar to Tom James last year almost have his own goal of the season yeah. contest as well yeah he really could alright so we were one up seven minutes of uh, additional time were played in the rest of the first half nothing to talk about really referee blew up O's went in one up at half time all hunky dory attendance announced just over 7,000 at 7,028 with 669 away fans making the journey decent turnout I thought from um, Exeter fans it's a, quite a decent number and quite a long journey on a Tuesday night and a uh, Let's be honest, they're not going up or going down. We're not going up or going down in a fairly relaxed, unmeaningful game to a certain extent. Yeah, I think as a fan, you think the games are sort of a little bit, don't mean much. However, to the players, they they always want to win. And I suppose as a fan, yes, you want your team to win. But if you're not playing for anything, I suppose you think, you do question yourself, especially when it's such a long journey. But... Fair play to them. Possibly Easter holidays played a big part. Yeah. The school kids being off, parents might have gone, oh, we'll go for, go to London for the night. But yeah, they made a lot of noise. And, they did. And at, at, at points they were out singing our fans, which you kind of expect from away fans Sometimes. to make a little bit more noise than they would at home. But that being said, our, our fans have been pretty top-notch all, all I season. Have. I did notice the exes had had a drumming. There was a drumming next time that was definitely making them sound louder yes. than what they yeah. were. And our drummers moved to the North Stand. There was a drumming in the North Stand. Not There's one in both as far as, oh, yeah, as, far as I've seen. But All right, yeah, I didn't realise there was one in the North Stand. <coughs> Obviously sitting next nearer to the North Stand, I could really hear the North Stand drum. All right, one change for the O's at half-time is Brandon Cooper replaced Omar Beckles. I guess not su- no surprises there. Beckles played a lot of football. I think he took a few whacks on Saturday and came off and probably... I think Rishi probably wanted to see Cooper alongside Simpson, having not seen that combination before. So let's fast forward to the 52nd minute. Some good pressure by Exeter. Saw Niscaven's shot from the left go just wide of Sol Brilliant near post. Good opportunity there uh, for Exeter and did take it. Yeah, he had a couple of good opportunities. I think as we're going to come on to now, in a couple of minutes later, uh, he had another opportunity as well, which you've not noted down, but he, he did look dangerous from the midfield. Mm. Um, but then we made a couple of subs as Max Sanders was replaced by George Munker and Rob Hunt came off to be replaced by Tom James. So very like for like, but also fresh legs that can hopefully change the game up for us. Yeah, all right, keep an eye on those subs because those subs are going to become relevant very soon. But we doubled our lead in the 63rd minute after some great pressure from Oli O'Neill. And poor defending from the visitors. So Oli intercept the pass from his defender on the edge of the box. He drove forward and Cooley laid the ball off to the oncoming George Munker, who finished from close range to make it 2-0 to the O's. Good goal there. Well played, Ollie. Again, winning the ball, making the right choice as well. Could have easily taken a shot on which wasn't the right choice. Yeah. Plays it to George with a, a fairly simple finish, but George has still got to hit the target and keep it low, which he does well. And at that point, at 2-0, I thought, not that you should ever think this as an Orient fan, but at 2-0, I thought, this is done. I, I wasn't thinking about the drama that was going to foreshadowed the game ahead no I think we were we were very much in control um, George took it very well however looking back at it afterwards it was also quite pleasing to see that if George hadn't got the ball I mean Joe Piggott was in was in a good place to to hopefully get good a tap spot. in as well so good spot no it's, it's nice to see George on the on the score sheet like I mentioned earlier he's a very he's very much a confidence player so hopefully that will give him give him a little bit of urgency well not necessarily urgency but a little bit of a push for the end of the yeah. year to, to go and add to it because I can't remember I remember he scored against Reading to win us the game in the 90th minute but I can't remember many other that he's scored yeah he's, this he's kind year. of got back in, into the team but yeah I think he, um, he's got one or two more but but nothing really what you would call sufficient I'm right, going to move forward to 74th minute and a huge point in the game as Brandon Cooper went down couldn't continue and as the O's had already made all their subs and Brandon couldn't continue, it meant we'd have to play out the remaining 15 minutes with 10 men. So obviously this led to Exeter piling on the pressure and Sol Brim had to 
be very alert to make a fingertip save in the eight second minute as Tom Carroll had an effort from close range from the right. It wasn't defended originally, the ball from the right in, and Carroll smacked it. It looked like it was going to go in, but Bryn done well there, to be fair to him, to yeah. keep the ball out. Yeah, he did very well. And then in the 84th minute, it's that Niskanen again. He had a big chance, but thankfully he sliced his effort from inside the area and the O's are able to get rid of the ball. Yeah, I still thought at this point, I mean, I didn't actually realise Brandon Cooper had gone off at this point, so I couldn't, I couldn't, I was half paying attention to my daughter who was loving the East End. Uh, <laughs> but I didn't realise we had 10 men, but I just thought it was kind of what happens in a game where you sit back and invite pressure as opposed to we actually only had 10 men. So Exeter did pull a goal back in the 87th minute. It'd been coming as Yannick Wildschut. They've got some quite difficult names to pronounce, Exeter City, so I'm glad we don't do an Exeter podcast. It'd been causing problems since he'd been on. He put an across from the left which was met by the head of Milenic Ali, who sent his header, or directed his header, I think it's fair to say, past Arbrin into the net to half the deficit to make it 2-1, to give Exeter a lifeline and to make it squeaky bum time. Yeah, he, been right. I mean, that was coming, right? They kept They were, they were banging that door in. Their left. But that wild shot, he, he was running rings around our defence, unfortunately, and eventually something was going yeah. to happen. But then we had six minutes of injury time coming up on the board and you think, come on, hold on to this. However, Mr Nussbaum, as you were about to say. Yeah, all right. First up was a big missed opportunity for Exeter. In the first minute, as they got down the left, pulled the pull ball back and a shot came in which was on target and that got deflected wide for a corner. So a big sigh of relief went up in the ground there. Yes, however, from that corner... They equalised through Tom Carroll. I mean, it did take a bit of a, a wicked deflection, leaving Solbrin flat-footed and into the opposite corner to where he was moving towards to equalise for Exeter, so it became 2-2. I mean, they took it short, they took it quickly, I think, which took us by surprise a little bit, and it gave Carroll like, the space to get hit room or adjust his body to get the volley away. He's, he's hit it well, and it's definitely going on target. Whether it's going in or not, I don't know. Um, but once it takes that deflection, it seems to go in slow motion. You just sort of, and then just go into the corner. And Bruno's got no chance there. To be fair to him, and then suddenly from being a plain sailing two nil, you're looking at two all. And I think there's still about two minutes left at this point, and you could feel that they thought they could win it because they don't celebrate too much. They get, they get the ball and they want to play because they feel that like they can win the points. Yeah, the momentum fully shifted towards Exeter and. Fair play to them. They they wanted to get going. They wanted to get the win. They didn't. Yeah. They didn't look like a poor team. We scored two good goals and they didn't give up. Yeah. So, fair play to them. Um, but with no further talking points, the referee blew for the final whistle, as the spoils were shared between the teams and Exeter taking a very late point. I suppose, in one sense, a sigh of relief from from Orient, thinking okay, Exeter could have got. Got it, but Exeter would be very, very happy with the point on the road. Absolutely. They celebrated like they were very happy. So Rishi Wellens spoke to the media after. We're not going to play it as that's been available since Tuesday evening and can be found on the club's website and the club's YouTube channel. That draw, though, means the O's stay in 10th place in League One. So at this point, had played 43, won 17, drawn 11, lost 15. Goal difference, which just will not go into a plus figure. So that goal difference is now zero still, or remained at zero. And now 62 points for the O. So I wrote these comments after the game, kept them quite short and quite sweet. So it felt like a bit of a nothing game, like you said. I mean, I wasn't sure if that was due to me sitting in a different stand, which isn't as noisy as what the South Stand normally is. Although a great view in the East Stand. Um, and felt really close to the action, although the atmosphere wasn't on par from what it is in the South Stand, which for some fans is important. Some fans isn't important, which for me made it feel like a different kind of game. I thought Oli O'Neill continues to impress. I thought Jack Simpson played well, clearly tired after doing or playing a lot of football in that game, as you would expect. Yeah. Again, he's not played a competitive game in a long, long time and then playing some on Saturday and followed up by 90 minutes on the Tuesday. I just said injuries and fatigue really catching up with us. You can tell like we're all having to go off as well to the treatment table with everyone else who's already on there. And just lots, like I've already said in this podcast, lots of football played in a lot of minutes. And at three games, it's a young team who were just quite tired and quite knackered and had done just one of those games on another day. Cooper can continue and we see that one out and it's fairly straightforward and we're celebrating. Just one of those things, I mean, I thought. What about you? What are your views when that full-time whistle went? Yeah, I thought, I thought we played okay for the most part and 
And although we were 2-0 up, I don't think Exeter had played poorly at all. I suppose if you look at the goal that we scored and the de- the deflected goal that they had, the lucky called out for both sides. Um, but I think losing Brandon Cooper to, mm. to his injury when we did was the sucker punch. However, you would have thought that with a 2-0 cushion, we we could have could have held on to it. But as you said, it is what it is. A point to point. When you're in the position that we are, where we're not yeah. looking for playoffs, we're not looking to go, just stay away from relegation. Take it, move on, learn from it, and go again as it was yesterday. Yeah. All right. Don't disagree. So those were our views. We had a, quite a lot of views that came in after the match. Thanks to everyone for sending them over. And as always, just because we read them doesn't mean that we agree with them. Boatsy started it off and said, "Typical Orient throwing away leads." We were all over the place when we went down to 10. Our shape was non-existent. However, the positives are that we didn't lose and great to see a goal direct from a corner onto Derby Way with no pressure at all. Yeah, at uh, Dave M1812, probably a fair result in the end, but I'm not really sure how many subs Richie wants to use all five with 15 minutes to go and not allow for injuries is strange. He does it in most games and it has finally come back to bite us. I think that's fair enough. I mean, he's managed the team for two years, and I think this has happened before. So I think on law of averages, I think that's fine. Yeah, I think this, the same point was made in the National League when you only had five subs. Yes. And Justin yeah. said, do you have a goalkeeper on the bench or do you not? That's right. In the, well remembered. In the risk of a goalkeeper being injured. So if it happens once in a season, it happens once in a season. Yeah, and so, sometimes you might get away with it. And obviously, others others you don't, I guess. Right, Boggs Dollocks won, less than impressive. It was an appallingly unprofessional performance in the last 10 minutes we made a poor team look like Real Madrid never works every way around though does it very annoyed so very frustrated there yep at Jake Murphy Media you can tell we played differently to usual which led to a more open game frustrating to lose a 2-0 lead but with being forced into 10 men for quite a while you could see it coming essentially guaranteed a top half finish now only goal difference could threaten that which is a very good point but considering we've we've only been I'll, I'll use the term battered in a couple uh, of games where we've lost lost by more than two goals, I don't think the goal difference is going to be too much of an issue. Hopefully, no, I don't think I end. don't think it is now. I think at one point it was looking like it could play a big bigger part, but I don't think it's going to it's going to define a, a a finish over someone else. No, by the looks of it at the moment, anyway. Stroud Greeno. So I'm not even annoyed. Just thought that was so weird. A bit unlucky to go down to 10. Now, you could argue we made our own bad luck using up our subs early. But given we're no longer playing for anything, I just thought we might as well have tried to attain some positivity. At John W999, strange one. Comfortable until we went to 10 men and then played 9 0 0, or 9 0 0 <laughs> formation with inevitable results. When you've got Adji, you've got an outlet. So why not use him as such rather than as what seemed like a second left back? Yeah, I mean, that's a fair point. It just seemed like we were just giving the ball away consistently when we haven't got it, just launching up the field and nobody no one was chasing there. it. So no. that's a fair point there from John. Matthew underscore White said, when is his fault for setting us up the way he did when we had 10 men? No one up front and no pressure on the ball was always going to result in extra scoring. Sat the same against Barnsley and Wigan and we lost both. I don't know why he persists with it when it clearly doesn't work. At Paint and Orient, a classic game of three quarters and a final chaotic quarter. I like that. Lots of encouraging performances nonetheless for the majority of the game. And it was a privilege to witness another worldie from Ollie O'Neill. It was certainly a good one. Carlos, he's 18, said, We have been cruising to victory with 11 men, with O'Neill, Obiero and Galbraith from pressing. Simpson also looks great if we can keep him. I don't know why we dropped so deep with 10 men. That led to the inevitable, but at least we got a point in the end. Yeah, I agree with the Simpson point. It's, it's almost... Uh, a paid for trial period with him he's come in he's, for me he's done very well, done so, well so, far. so I'm very happy if, if, we'd, if we keep hold of him uh, David Carroll won decent performance of X to never really offered much going forward then Cooper has to go off and we drop too deep to try and defend the lead X to will see it as revenge for our late winner and ultimately the number of goals that we have shipped in the last 10 minutes have cost us dear good point there obviously we, we beat Exeter Two one, and we're yeah, out scored in with the, the last, last minute. minute, and so they've kind of had their revenge. Although we beat them and they drew with us, so I, I'd rather 
be in our situation than theirs where we've taken four points from them and they've taken one from us. But also a good point about the number of goals we ship in the last 10 minutes of games. I'm sure there's a stat about there who can let us know how many goals we've conceded late in games and how many points like we've lost. Like the ones that spring to mind, obviously Barnsley, um, yeah. that I can remember. Um, yeah, main, obviously Exeter. I'm sure there's probably a few more. So good point there from David Carroll, Heavy D, who sits in front of us. And the final word then is Sunshine LOFC, who said coasting when it was 11 against 11. Got it very wrong though when we went down to 10. Nevertheless, the LOFC totally exceeded expectations for the majority of this season. However, I fancy League One will be much stronger next season, but there's loads to be optimistic about up the O's. So good finish to the sweets there from Joe at Sunshine LOFC, and we hope his trip yesterday to Derby County on the Sunshine bus went well. We are sure it did, so thanks to everyone who tweeted us uh, after the Exeter game. Yep, moving on to the At Saltire Orient Prediction League. Uh, fair play to Ben Whitlock and Sh- I don't apologies if I say this wrong. Strop O, yeah. uh, who predicted the two two, and they get three points. Absolutely, well done to Ian Hutchinson, CM Oriental. They predicted two plus one of the goal scorers, so they got four points. And a top of the table roundup will follow at the end of the podcast. So we move on to Wednesday, the tenth of April. A quiet day at the club. No news to report, so let's move on to Thursday, then for April, where it wasn't quiet. There was an announcement and lots of social engagement about this one. Oh, not half. Um, so the club revealed that the shirt to be worn in the upcoming pre-season friendly at Hearts, which will be costing fans £75 to purchase. So it's fair to say this one, like we said, caused a lot of discussion on social media. Lots of people thinking it was overpriced, a lot of people thinking it was a fair price. I think, first of all, it's a nice shirt. I don't think anyone's debating the look of the shirt, the design of the shirt. It's very uh, close to what the O's wore when the original fixture um, was played and the history of the date of those teams. It's very relevant, like it. I do think £75 is a bit steep in this day and age. I know it's a limited edition shirt. I know it's obviously cost to have a bespoke shirt made I do think £75 is a bit more than what I would have paid for it my heart sank a little bit when I saw £75 I saw the club's tweet about it I thought looks very nice everyone then hits the link right because there's no mention of the price hits the link and I think I was I think when you perceive a figure of a shirt to be roughly around £44.50 which I guess is the standard price of a football shirt when you've got that number in your head and you see a higher number, it kind of knocks you a bit. So I thought, it's nice. I thought, I won't be buying it. However, it transpires that you <coughs> did have, buy it. Yes. All right, so I guess from your perspective then, your views on the shirt and in kind of... It's, it's a lovely shirt. Yeah. It is a very, very nice shirt. Mark Devlin, I'm not bothered by a box. I'll be totally honest with you. Um, however... I wasn't expecting to pay seventy five pounds. Yeah. I was I was in the same same as you. I thought okay, fifty quid is a fair price. But then I thought okay, well I've got the one from the Bromley game a couple of years back when that is Josh Corona shot, yeah. scored the free kick and terrorised George oh, Porter. That's still one of my favourite games in the last ten years. That game, um, amazing game. So yeah, I've got that one. I've got a is it a Bravo sponsored one from oh, the late, yeah the yeah. nineteen ninety nine two thousand season or something along those lines. Um, so I think I was always going to buy it. I wasn't expecting to pay them the amount of money I did. However, me and my other half went up to the Nike shop in Oxford Circus yesterday and an England training shirt these days is near enough £60. Yeah. So I think the price of football shirts is going up, rightly or wrongly, yeah. especially when they cost... They don't cost anywhere near that amount to make. But I think it's also the market we're in. Yeah, okay. Fair point, fair point. That's a very valid point you make about the England shirts. And I guess if you support a Premier League team, you're probably paying more than 50 quid for your team's shirt, right? So I guess it might be strange to us, but maybe to a bigger team, that's probably probably the norm. I mean, I don't think they're going to have problems selling the majority of stock based on the people who were tweeting about it or posting about it on whether it's Facebook or Forum or Twitter. Even though it's £75, is put off a lot of people. There's people who won't be put off, who will think, well, it's a one-off, yeah. very historical, 
it comes in a nice box or whatever, yeah. <laughs> or whatever reason, who will buy the shirt. Won't necessarily wear it for that game, but will keep it in its box yeah. as a historical as... monument to late in Orient and pass it down their generations or whatever. So I think as it's a keepsake, a I think it's good. But then at the same time, I think I can't remember who said it, but I think you've got that and the season ticket cost of over. Yeah, I mean, my point. season ticket next season is. Four hundred and twenty odd pound. Yes. When you take into account all the postage and stuff, yes. so to have that so close to one another is slightly frustrating. Yeah, that's a very good point as well. Well made. All right, we had lots of views that come into us. We didn't ask for them. We're not going to mention them um, in this episode. So we're going to move on to Friday, the twelfth of April. It was another quiet day at the club. It seemed like a lot of people were going up to Derby on the Friday, from what I could see on social media, making like a proper weekend of it. And yeah, as you would, right? It's obviously Derby think, County. It's a big yeah. club. It's, big a, it's not a short journey either. So, if you want to spend that little bit more money and take an easier journey up yeah. on the the day before, rather than stressing about the traffic r- on the rubbish day. trains that we've got in this country <laughs> at the moment, then <laughs> then that's probably the, not the daftest thing to do in the world, is it? Yeah. So I so, saw some good pictures on the Friday, but a quiet day at the club. So Saturday, the thirteenth of April, the Young O's were in action at home to Sutton United. We'll cover this one briefly. We took the lead in the fifth minute as Charlie Pegram regained the ball, dinked the keeper from the edge of the box to make it 1-0, but Sutton equalised as the teams went in level at the break. So second half, Young O's retook the lead in the 58th minute with Marley St. Louis cut inside, curled the ball into the top left corner to make it 2-1. And we sealed the win in the 76th minute when substitute Uko Oji turned, bundled the ball into the bottom left corner to make it 3-1, which is how the game finished. Well done to the Young O's. The Young O's go from strength to strength. They think they lost in last week's podcast, but apart from that, have done fantastically well. Good to see Charlie Pegram get a goal. Love to see it. So that was the Young O's as we move on into the main event, the trip to Derby County. Yes. Now, as is customary before every game <laughs> of the season, you know it. Steve and Paul run a Twitter poll to find out how you thought the O's would get on. So, 404 votes... We're casting this one, and 21% of you optimistic folk thought that Orient would win, 23% a draw, and 56% of you thought we would get defeated. Okay, all right, pretty Thank fair. you for your votes. Yeah, as always. All right, team was announced at 2 o'clock. We sold Brinning Goal at the back. Tom, James, Jack Simpson, Omar Beckles, and Ethan Galbraith with Jordan Brown, Dan Prattley, and George Monker, Shaq Ford, Ollie O'Neill. And Kay and Edwards making up 11 on the bench. We had Sam Howes, Rob Hunt, uh, Paul Chenedu, uh sorry, Phil Chenedu, it's a new name on me, sorry, Phil, Phil Chenedu, Max Sanders, Zek Obiero, Dan Adu Aji, and the original Dan Aji making up the rest of the bench. Yeah, that still throws me that we managed to sign, <laughs> we managed to sign a Dan Aji after Dan Aji got injured. Podcasting nightmare. Yes. Um, so that <laughs> starting lineup meant that Richie made five changes again to the team from midweek. As 16-year-old centre-back Phil Chenedu came in to the O's match day squad for the first time, taking a place on the bench. So, well done, Phil. It's definitely a name that we've got to yeah. look out for because I think Richie might have said before that the difference between youth football and men's football is massive. So, he obviously thinks that there is there is a player in there or he can give the first-team experience to, to Phil. So, that's definitely something positive from the off. Yeah, I mean, when that team was announced... Quite a lot of thoughts on this one. There's a few omissions. So obviously, <coughs> Jaden Sweeney, who started the game on Tuesday, wasn't in the squad um, at all for that one. So I hope Sweeney is okay, if not injured. Obviously, Piggott started the game against Exeter. Nowhere to be seen in the squad. So again, hope Piggott is okay. So those were two instant names where you just thought what's happened to them. Again, so for me, that's not a bad team. There's one name who stands out on that. And you go... You're starting Edwards, like really. Uh, I know Rich has been very good at managing plays back. I thought if it's a choice out of Edwards, I thought why not start Adji and give Adji fifty minutes, fifty five minutes, and give Cal maybe the last forty. I thought Adji's been back now for three, four, three, weeks. four weeks. Yeah, give or take. I think it's Peterborough when he first got on the pitch. He's, they're kind of steadily building him up. I thought we might see Adji start that one. I mean, no disrespect to Edwards. I'm sure Edwards is a lovely fella, but when I kind of saw his name on the team sheet, I thought, I, I don't know what Edwards is going to bring to the team. I, I don't want to pick on young players. I, it's not what this podcast is about, but I did see that and just thought, I'm not sure we've got that one right there. Um, 
I was a bit disappointed not to see Adji start. Apart from that, starting eleven, I thought actually that's quite an experienced, maybe young, but an experienced team. Um, nonetheless, and like you said, Chinedu has not even been out on loan to a National League or National League South side. He's 16. Obviously tells you Beckles isn't available. Tells you that Cooper isn't available. And there's basically no other centre-backs available. But Richie obviously wanted one on the bench and that's how Chinedu makes his way into that. So from a youth perspective, if you're an academy player, you look at that bench, you go, right, Zek's on the bench there, Chinedu's on the bench there, which looks really good. Happy days. And he's playing a very young player in Edwards on loan from another club Adu Adji's very young on loan from another club and Shaq Ford is on loan from another club very young if you're an academy player you'd be thinking actually if I can keep my form up I, I could get a chance in this team sooner rather than later so I think from a youth perspective it's fantastic to see especially at such a big club and big game such as Derby yeah I think for me not having Joe Piggott in the squad was a bit of a shock um there's a lot of opinions out there yeah. about Joe, um, which I'm not going to go into. However, it's always nice to have someone like him come off the bench where he's slightly different to some of the other players we've got here, as he's a bit taller, so he can be a bit more of an aerial presence. But not having him and Sweens missing out as well, hopefully there's not nothing too serious with yeah. those. Um, I can kind of understand Dan Adji not not starting yeah. with there only being two or three games left. Yeah. Um, but kind of does a start a lot. I would have liked to have seen the other Dan Agi okay, fair point. coming in and, and giving it a go. But as someone who loves Darren Prattley, I'm buzzing to see him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, buzzing thought, to see him I starting. I might see Prattley back for this one. I had a little feeling they don't mention him. No, I mean, we've got him for all. another 10 years. So. <laughs> You're his biggest fan, right? So... <laughs> Rob JB nineteen lots of tweets I think Fred say when this one that came through. Rob JB nineteen seventy four said considering the number of players currently unavailable, that's a pretty strong starting eleven. I would agree with that. Yeah, I think we've pretty much all season we've battled with injuries. Yeah, yes. um, but we've always managed to put out a team that you think will be competitive. Uh, Alan Reeves too, Derby centre backs may as well get the deck chairs and cigars out having to play against Edwards. Should be a nice easy day for them. Lord Piggott not in the squad. Waller adds, it says, looks like the strongest team we can put out, considering injuries, which I think it probably is, to be fair. Yep. Uh, Mr. Russ Mill, how on earth can you even include Edwards in the squad, playing with 10 men? LFC Teresa makes a comment relevant to last week's podcast. It says, I'm a Rob Hunt fan, but where is Jaden Sweeney? Yeah, I'm, I'm a Rob Hunt fan as well, but I would like to have seen Sweeney on, on the bench at, at least. Uh at Phil Vasey, one desperately in need of Darren Prattley coming back in, which I could not agree with more. Yeah, it brings a good level of experience uh, yeah. to the midfield. Bit yeah, of composure. Definitely. Especially at a big, big ground in front of a big, big crowd such as Derby. And Lenchin Chin one tweeted us and said, I fear our game will be an uphill struggle due to the patched up team we have available. A little bit of luck would help our cause. Priorities are an early goal. It's important to keep the channels covered and defend with everything. Plus be clinical. Good luck, lads. Yeah, I think that's nice and positive. It, I think you look at the lineup and you you get a tinge of negativity if you don't see your favourite player or an informed player yeah, in the true. squad. Um, but Richie can only choose who he Absolute, can choose from absolutely. from what he's yeah, got yeah. available. So if we're patching up players, then that's what he's got to do. Yeah, that's what he gets paid. Agree. Paid to do, and he's done pretty well so far, hasn't he? Agree. So the match kicked off a very very busy Pride Park with the O's looking to finish the season strongly against the Derby County side, fighting for automatic promotion, looking for their fifth win in a row at Pride Park. Yeah, so they were going to be, obviously, no mouths. They're sixth, second uh, in League One. They've obviously beat us 3-1 at Brisbane Road. Yeah, they, they, they were very win. strong. They were good that day. So in the second minute, Shaq Ford went on a decent run. He got the ball just inside Derby's half. Went on a lovely run, actually. Cut inside from the right, kept moving centrally. Got to a decent position, had a strike which is well wide of Wildsmith's far post. Yeah, I've noticed Shaq does like a, a cut in mm. and then hit, and it, it's worked quite a few times since he scored goals from that position, but he's definitely, you're looking at Kyan Edwards and Adu Adji and you've got to say that Shaq Ford is the standard of absolutely a young point. lone player at the moment because he has done very well. Very well. Uh, in the 11th minute, Derby take the lead as Nathaniel Mendes Lang swung a corner in from the left, which evaded everybody, including Sol Brin, and the ball ricocheted off George Monker with Kane Wilson just behind him to make it 1-0 to the host. Now, 
the goal could well have gone in anyway. People would have got on George's back if he didn't make any kind of effort to play the ball. So it is what it is. It's probably a bit of a more of a talking point there, saying that ball is awfully close to the goal. Should your yeah. goalkeeper be a bit braver or should your goalkeeper be claiming that? For me, I don't want to jump on Bryn's back because Bryn's had a lot of critics uh, over the last two weeks, but I think Bryn has to be doing better there. Yeah, I think if you consider the Peterborough game where he did come out 4-1 and and missed yeah. it, I th- that might have shot his confidence a little bit and I, thought, yeah, okay, good point. if I stand there, I can, I've got a chance of making the save. But that's what... Simon Royce's job is to yeah. to get him out of that funk almost and say look that happened yeah, I feel forget like, it I think that has not his confidence a little bit like, yeah I think because he, he does try and get the ball it's not like he's just glued to his line he does make no a, he's come out quite a lot during a week, the season a weak effort to get the ball and I think maybe the, the sovereign early in the season potentially gets that ball yeah a bit more fearless but it's just what we didn't want to happen being a goal down early in the 15th minute across from Tom James was met by Shaq Ford at the far post whose header was off target. And three minutes later, unfortunately, Derby double delayed again from a corner as Sibley's effort or delivery, so he was met by the on-rushing and unmarked Sonny Bradley, who volleyed the ball into the roof of the net from about a yard out to make it 2-0. Again, I think it's fair to say it's quite poor defending. Bradley comes in fairly unmarked. Beckles is literally on top of his man uh, and Bradley just comes by himself looked like it was Tom James's man but either way poor all round again you could argue maybe should bring, be coming out there to try and give himself a better chance of getting the ball but a good finish from Bradley and suddenly mountains to climb 18 minutes gone and 2-0 down yeah I think it, it's frustrating to go 2-0 down so early on but at the same time you've still got another 70 minutes then to to bring it back uh, nothing to mention though until the 38th minute as Sibley again advanced into the O's area, but a very good block by Omar Beckles and a break in play a minute later as Kaon Edwards needs treatment, but thankfully he was okay to continue. All right, 44th minute, Ethan Galbraith, who has been a good goal scoring form lately, had a strike from outside the box around 25 yards, but Bradley managed to get in the way of his efforts. Uh, three additional minutes were put up and played, and in the second of those, Tom James sent a free kick 30 yards from 30 yards out, straight into the hands of Joe Wildsmith. And a minute later, Ethan Galbraith needed treatment after a collision with Collins, but he was OK to continue. The referee blew the half-time whistle and the O's trade in 2-0. Yeah, so attendance announced at Pride Park with a whopping 30,247. I mean, that, that is, that's a ridiculous amount of people to go to a League One game with 1,347 of those being O's fans. Just shows you the strength of Derby County as a League One club, so well done to every away fan who made that journey. It looks like a nice stadium as well. Unfortunately, we couldn't be there. Had a few tweets at half-time. The untold game wasn't impressed. So Tom Jane, normally the untold game is very positive. It's quite an interesting tweet from from uh, the untold game. Tom James has been stealing a living since Christmas. So he needs to understand that he's an average League One player now, not a good League Two player. Leave the playing to his better teammates and focus on the job. I think that was off the offset of the free kick. I think the free kick, and again... We're looking at a few derby accounts were quite critical of that free kick where it was a decent position and it literally was like a nothing ball. So I'm not sure if that was frustration into into the free kick. Obviously Tom James is, is a, another talking point of a player who was very good in the league two, hasn't that he's done all right, I think, in League One. I think he's not scored yet this season. I might be wrong. I think he's scored a goal no, yet right. and we're used to I think we were spoiled last year with him scoring. I think since he's been at the club I've been spoiled every season you get at least three yeah. or four like Goals from absolutely nowhere. Yeah, he's got. A, James. He has got a very good range on his shooting. Yeah, this year it's not quite worked out. Whether teams are, are wiser to him, or he's just not. Yeah, not found it yet. But I think that tweet could be more out of the frustration of the half. Probably right. Yeah. Than anything, um, but the menace eighteen eighty one said it's an impressive stadium and the noise is incredible. Half time score not ideal. But we listen to the circus upstairs on the way up here and we need to put into perspective and remember how far we've come. Whatever the final score, it's a great day out. And I think that's a good point. I mean, I've, I've listened to pretty much every episode of that and, and think how, what, how we are very lucky. But yeah. also, Derby were in a bit of a perilous position, not so long ago themselves. So both clubs are built again. 
and hopefully we can look at what they've done and replicate it in the future. Yeah, I mean, we've obviously the podcast was, was quite active, uh, has always been active, but was quite active during that time. Yeah, with, with Circus Upstairs refers to, and we look at our Facebook memories quite a lot. And at the moment, we're getting reminders of all the auctions we've done, which are coming through for the regeneration fund. So I think it's like the anniversary of when we put Mooney's FIFA shirt up. So we keep getting yeah. reminders like seven years ago or six years ago you've done this and you posted this so it's easy, easy to forget how far the club have come in that short space of time so a very good tweet there from Janine uh, and Dennis so right, one change for the O's at half time is Dan Adji came on for uh, Kyan Edwards so in the 53rd minute Ethan Galbraith picked up a yellow card as he made a late challenge on someone we've not spoken about and don't like speaking about the podcast so I think he's a wonderful player XO he's on loan there Mr Ebu Adams yeah, I, love a, it. I think it's a he's a contentious player. player. However, if he was still playing in the late night, you would shirt, love, him, love him. Yeah, you would. Uh, in the fifty seventh minute, Louis Sibley played the ball from the left into the path of Mendes Lang, whose right footed effort just went over the bar. And four minutes later, a long ball over the top saw Mendes Lang again beat the offside trap, and Tom James to get one on one with Sol Brin who made the save from his effort. Brynn done well there, I think, to save his effort. But again, so, e- so easy for them. That long ball over the top, and literally Mendes Lang's off and away. It's too easy for them. Got to make it more difficult. All right, 63rd minute in, second sub for the O's, as Rob Hunt came on, uh, in place to George Monker. So Monker will get in just over an hour game time. Yeah, I think that seems standard at the moment for George, whether that's building up fitness or or his his max. Yeah. Um, but he does... He d- he does his job very well of holding onto the ball. Yeah, so, true. in the 64th minute, following some tenacious build up play, Ollie O'Neill got down the left byline, squared the ball to Ethan Galbraith, whose first time effort goes over the, goes over the bar. Decent effort there. All right, five minutes later, Omar Beckles as well, as he got back to deny James Collins a tap in as Mendes Lang put in a low cross following a quick derby free kick. So, I don't know, Omar done well there, covered his line very well. And in the 77th minute, a few more subs for the O's as Zek Abirio and Max Sanders come on for Tom James and Super Darren Prattley. Yeah, so it's, you know, Zek Abirio will get like 15 minutes to play Derby County. That'll be good for his development, so can't agree with that. We're going to fast forward to 10 minutes, so to the 87th minute, and Derby sealed the points from another corner as this time Kola Houlihan delivered a left footed in swinger from the right. He put it into the back post, and again, Sonny Bradley there lurking, unmarked second goal of the game, 3 0. Again, far too easy. Three corners, three goals. Another disappointing goal to concede. Far too easy for Derby. Game set match. Very much so. Whether they've looked at our weaknesses. Yeah, you, you presume so. It's possible. Paul Warren's a very astute manager. Um, but it's something that we will learn from, I would I would hope, and build on for maybe the next two games or next season. All right, OK. Four minutes of additional time are played. And despite a few more chances for Derby's Connor Washington, I mean, it shows you the kind of depth. Connor Washington comes on for them as a sub, and he probably makes most kind of League One. He would make our starting lineup. He would make our starting lineup. Nothing further to report as referee blew the full time whistle, with the O's disappointingly falling to a 3 0 defeat at Derby County. So Richie Wellen spoke to Dave Victor after the game. Thank you to Dave for sending that over. With two games covered, we're not going to play this due to the length of the podcast, but Richie's interview is available on the club's YouTube channel and it's available on the club's website as well. It's a fairly brief one at four and a half minutes, but Richie makes some good points and obviously goes into into the game and a few other bits and pieces. So unfortunately, that defeat means the O's stay in 10th place. So play 44, won 17, drawn 11, lost 16. Now goal difference are minus three. 62 points. So again, for me, going to keep it fairly short, fairly simple. Going to Derby County at the best of times is always going to be a massive ask. But I think, depending on what we did within the first 20 minutes, game was done. All three goals, poor to concede. Richard will know that. He won't need me to sit here on a podcast and tell him that. Um, team looks tired now. And I think that's a fairly uncharacteristic performance. It's not the kind of performance we're used to seeing from a Richie Williams Orient team. But completely understandable, I think it's fair to say, given the injuries and the fatigue setting into this team. Great way to support, from what I hear. What you know to send almost fourteen hundred fans to Derby County at the end of the season, League One is, is phenomenal. Look, two games left to go. 
to finish 10th in the League One, which it looks like we're going to do in our first season back, would be some achievement. Like I said on last week's pod, if we would have sat here in August, September in a DeLorean saying, you know, we're going to skip you 4 to April, you're going to be quite comfortably 10th. You'd go, yeah, I'd be happy with that. I think that's an amazing achievement. Hopefully we take the maximum points from the last two games. Guarantee ourselves for 10th place finish. Kick on from there. Job done for me. I'd be happy with that. What about you? Yeah, I think you proved my point that I mentioned earlier that about the the games at home that we had with Portsmouth and Derby earlier in the year with them, them being be, right? very, very good. Um, and the fact that they scored three from corners and didn't really create massive amount of real troublesome stuff from open play says a lot about how resilient that they are and the different ways that they can win. Um, weirdly, I'm not too bothered by the, by the defeat when you've got nothing playoffs are out the window. You're not, you're yeah. not going down. Um, it's a good opportunity to learn learn from it and it's obviously a real even better opportunity for Richie to look at the players that are out of contract yeah. and those that are on loan and go look do I want to extend these loans do I want to keep the players at the club or I suppose from a player perspective if they don't think they're going to get an extended deal with us they've got to put themselves in the shop window so so yeah I think it's more of a look to the future than a present present time at the moment. Okay, good point. Well made. All right, time for your views on this one. Again, a lot of tweets coming to us or an outlook once that full-time whistle went. Ed Sylvester won. So what a bloody anticlimax. <laughs> I just wish the season would end now. We seriously need to strengthen in the summer. At Ellen Isabella, pathetic performance, three corners, three goals. Happy to never see Bryn in goal again. So Bryn's getting a lot of criticism in here. I think there's um, a few good tweets coming up about Bryn, uh, both for and against. Richie J. Bourne said, set-piece nightmares, need a commanding goalkeeper in those situations and an alert defence. Got done three times and that's poor. Some out of contract players have done themselves no favours in these last couple of games. At Patrick won the flood. Well, by the sounds of it, Derby could have had a hat, a hat full. We were poor. The young loanees are proving pointless. Please play our own youngsters in the remaining games. Been a few tweets around that. You know, Charlie Pogram, for example, was on the bench first game of the season, quite early on in the season when we had a few injuries, scoring for the youth team. I wouldn't be I'd... that disappointed to see Charlie Pogram turn up on the bench in place of someone like an Edwards no. or an Adu Ajay. Yeah, I agree. I think someone you've like got that. to you've got to look after your own sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I can't think of... Well, maybe, I mean, you know, the youth team have done very well, so maybe they'll, we'll all see one or two hit the bench for the last two games. Poplar, 32, so that was men against boys, outplayed and outmuscled, but at least it shows Richie the lack of quality we have available at the moment. The loan signings have, in general, been disappointing. Time to build for pre-season now with a settled squad. I think loans are such a big thing at this level, though. It is. It it, totally they is. do make up the squad, and you think some of them have been disappointing. However, Idris has... Is on loan. He's done. He's done well again. I think for the most part, Sol Brin's done, done well as well. So you're going to get the odd one that doesn't quite work out. Yeah, it's fine. At Conway underscore Nigel, uh, last few results irrelevant. But what it has shown Richie is that there is plenty of dead wood to clear out before next season. I don't really know where to start. Orient underscore Ed who sits in front of us in the south stands, very angry about defending. James and Beckles were caught time and time again from corners. We were shocking. Ford looked lively to start, but lost interest. And O'Neill kept coming inside, so he lacked his threat. But Adji having a half was a big positive. Looked quite sharp. Yeah, hopefully Adji's picking up fitness again for, for next year. Just need him to hit the ground running, I think, next year. Yeah. At Daniel underscore D44. I know the squad is depleted, but that was very poor. Some of the senior players were so half-hearted today. Thought only Prattley and Brown and Abirio came away with any credit. Dan Orton 2590 said, I hate playing for nothing with a fully fit squad, let alone a depleted one. That's too young and knackered. Game was over as a contest after 10 minutes and too many have just checked out as well. We finished 10th, great season, all things considered. Yeah, a fairly fairly measured tweet that. Yeah. At Mark Cross 63689509, didn't expect much more, but it's now a massive summer. Some players have played their way out of a new contract over the last four weeks. And given Richie a decision, he probably didn't think he could be making a couple of months ago. Interesting point there from Mark Paolo, 1986. Said, we need to use perspective. Our season essentially 
finished playing away at Derby, who are about to clinch promotion in front of a huge crowd. Disappointing to lose 3-0, but glad it's a game we can afford to not lose any sleep about. 10th likely place finish in League One is a great first season back. Agreed. At James Eastwood, 83, no shots on target. Given the ball away when not under pressure, giving them too much respect and not defending well enough at corners done us. Just don't want the remaining games to turn into a formality because we are safe. That's not a good look to the paying fans. D John's 1998. <coughs> so men against boys again. The frustrating thing is we are too easy to cut through. Teams are taking three or four passes to get from their box to the edge of ours and it takes us at least 15 passes to do the same. Brilliant has been brilliant for most of the season. But his confidence is absolutely shot. Good point yeah. there about Brie. Good point about teams. There's Derby done it a couple of times where two passes and they were like through our defence. It's not something we've seen Orient do a lot. But again, you can't, I don't really want to sit and compare Orient's team or squad to Derby County's. Although the next tweet is actually from a Derby fan who tweeted us uh, with their views on the game. Yeah, JXCMX. Apologies if I pronounced that wrong. Uh, you I all played. Really, I don't really listen, mate. I think it's fine. <laughs> you never know. You all played your part in a great atmosphere. I'm glad you were mid table for your first season back in League One. It's a tremendous effort, and I wish you all well for next season. Very nice, sweet, yeah. Very classy, and I think Derby will have a bit more financial clout than us. They've got <laughs> just a bit. with with thirty thousand people turn up every, <laughs> if they turn up every week. Then that's three times as many as we get. So. They are going to be in a in a better position to go. Yeah, I mean they're, de- they're a decent side. They're a decent championship squad side, aren't they? Good yeah. championship size size. I mean, as opposed to squad. Yeah, absolutely. Final word then goes to Matty Lofc Evans, who said we were never <coughs> going to be a strong or well balanced Derby team. Proud of our league position with two games to go, but we are now seeing who's up to the task. Big big summer ahead. Richie needs to be backed, and we need to desperately clear out at least four or five who aren't good enough. There's a lot of talk about clearing out players. We're not going to go into too much depth around that. That will be something for the season finale. And we'll obviously ask for lots of your views on that, and I'm sure we will get them. But lots of interesting tweets on that one that have been read out. Let us know if you agree or disagree with any of those by giving us a tweet at Orient Outlook. You can also give us an email at Orient Outlook at Outlook.com. You can also find us on Instagram at Orient underscore Outlook underscore podcast. You can also find us on Facebook at Orient Outlook podcast. Yep, moving on to the At Saltire Orient Prediction League update. Uh, Mr. JG Essex at Steve White LOFC, at C Vlatas, at O's Fans Basin, at Walla Ad, at Alex Mold 75. Well done to you guys, I, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for predicting the correct result, and you guys get three points. They certainly do. So, two games left. That means the prediction league is very tight at the top with Dave Brew, 47976911, leading the way on 28 points. Three points behind him, and it could all change with one correct prediction now as Rio underscore Orient and Steve Chapman for one point behind them on 24 points as Eastside Orient, Paul R. Gregory, and Fiat de Wyvern. And one point behind them is Dan William H. and LOFC Teresa. The full prediction league table can be found on our Facebook page. And as always, thanks for all your predictions. Two games left, lots of points up for grabs. It's going to go down to the wildest one, and we will see who wins it on the final day of the season. Yes, and moving on to today, Sunday the 11th or Sunday the 14th of March. Sorry, Mom. the <laughs> car had a mare there. Uh, the O's We're ladies. Right. To be fair, I think that's on us more than you because we put March in our little plan. We got to. Don't oh, it's April, anymore. isn't it? Christ. So the O's ladies were in action at home to the Comets, uh, and unfortunately, within 22 minutes, they were two 0 down. However, they got it back in the 27th minute as Wright played a first-time ball into Cabo who skinned her opponent and slid the ball under the goalkeeper into the near corner to make it 2-1. And shortly after, Wright turned into the scorer. Oh, no, she didn't. Uh, She hit the bar. And then the ball got swung back into the box by Cabu, and Wright then did finish the job to make it 2-2. The Comets retook the lead in the 39th minute to make it 3-2, which is how the first half ended. certainly did. The second half, then the Comets extended the lead, make it 4-2 in the 58th minute. And this for the game gets a little bit crazy, but in the best possible way. The O's pull the goal back in the 74th minute. as a lovely through ball from Carty set Cabu in on goal, and she calmly started it in to make it 4-3. But we levelled it up in the 86th minute when Feldman picked up the ball, played Cabo in on goal, and she fired the ball in to the far left corner, getting a hat-trick. And then with the game looking destined for a draw in the 94th minute, the O's won the game as Hannah Jenks cut inside three Comets players 
and then put in a powerful strike, beating the keeper to make it 5-4 at the death and to win the game. Well done to the ladies on an amazing result. There are three games left. Anything can happen. And I think the O's ladies can still win their league if they're very lucky, win all their games and other teams lose all theirs. We'll obviously keep you posted on that one. So at one hour, 10 minutes, 70 minutes, it's time to wrap up this bad boy. We'll start with a fantasy football update. And Josh Abrahams is top of our Orient Outlook podcast, Fantasy Football League. He's got 2,068 points. He's ahead of Jamie Willem in second place on 2,040 points. So open up a bit of a lead there. Now as Josh, there's a bit more uh, Premier League remaining rather than two games. So well done there. You play Fantasy Football League as well, right? So I we do, really talk yes. about where I am. So I am 220th place in this league. Out of 324 players, I've got a bad feeling you're going to be beating me in this one. Yeah, I'm 160th. Oh, well played, um, Mr Kane. Yeah, the aim is to finish in the top half. I think there's no way I'm catching Josh now, unfortunately. Uh, so you've got that moral victory over me, Josh. So positives and negatives right, this Mr. week. Kane, you can go as you're the guest. Oh. We always balance this out. I'll let you do. There's three positives and there's three negatives, Mr. Kane. You can take away the positives. So first off, that support at Derby County. Amazing. Fair play to everyone that yeah. that made the journey up there. It's not an easy journey. Even bigger kudos to those that have stayed overnight. To make a weekend of it. Absolutely. Um, another positive, Oli O'Neill scoring from a corner, giving a lot of O's fans possibly the, one of the best goals they've ever seen. <laughs> I don't remember us ever scoring from a corner no, in recent I, memory. I, I'm sure I, there's I someone know. out there someone that will tell us. us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the youth and ladies team's results this weekend have also been very encouraging for, for the development and looking at the club from other angles as well. All right, great stuff. For me, I'll do the negatives of the week. So first up, defeat at Derby County. Maybe expected, but we're still going to put it in as a negative. Second negative is letting a two-goal lead slip against Exeter City. Obviously, reasons for that, but still have to look at it as a negative in black and white. And lastly, the ever-growing injury list. So add Brandon Cooper onto that list from the Exeter game. Add Royal Satuyu onto that list from the Exeter game. Potentially add Sweeney. Potentially add Piggott onto that. Maybe not. However, there's at least two new names on that injury list, so it's very difficult to manage. But one of those seasons where injuries have just consistently got in the way of ever starting our first 11. So negative spans out the positives. And time for our Hero of the Week. So we're a unanimous or an out of podcast tower. It's not every day you talk about a goal from a corner. And this gent also got an assist. We've raved about him on the podcast. So I guess it's going to be no surprise that your out of podcast Hero of the Week is... Mr. Ollie O'Neill. So well done, Oz. Well done, Ollie O'Neill. All right, next week's fixtures in just one game now, coming up next week. Only got two games left of the season. This one is our final home game of the season. It's Fleetwood Town visit Brisbane Road on Saturday, the 20th of April. Fleetwood Town currently sits 23rd in League One, but not yet relegated as they beat Northampton 2 0 at home on Saturday. In their last five, they've won one, drawn one and lost three. They go away to Peterborough on Tuesday, so I guess there's a chance they might get relegated in midweek. However, the last team to get almost be relegated and go to posh uh, was Carlisle, and they turned them over before they got relegated 3-1. So strange things have happened in this world of football. We will see what happens. But if you see us down there on Saturday, say hello, give us an oi oi, and come and see us for the final time in our seats in the South Stand this season. Yep, just a sponsorship reminder, not to forget to get in touch with... John and their fantastic team of experienced florists. To get in touch with them, you can call them on 0208 529 4130 or get in contact via social media at Carol Langley E4 or at Essex Biz on Twitter. They're on Instagram at Carol Langley Florist and on Facebook at Carol Longley Carol Langley Florist. And I'm sure if you go into the shop as well, you can chew John's ear off about all ah. things football and he'd, he would love that. He absolutely would. All right, so that is it. And thank you to, for joining us in episode 353. It was the final time of the season having two games in a week. And it was all going so well. So we took a two-goal lead against Exeter, only to go down to 10 men for injury, which allowed the visitors to strike twice and take a point back to Devon. And up next, we face promotion at Hopefuls Derby County in front of a huge crowd, losing 3-0 and not, quote-unquote, putting on a show for the 1,300-plus fans who made the trip. So we now look to the final home game of the season next week against Fleetwood Town and it's a chance for the players to sign off positively at Brisbane Road and we'll be talking about all that game next week and hopefully talking about three points and a win and you'll be able to hear that in the next episode of the Orient Outlook podcast. 
Yes, if you are listening on iTunes, please subscribe and give the podcast a five-star rating. Or if you're listening on Spotify, don't forget to rate the show and you can leave a comment on each episode. So please do so if you get the chance. Don't forget to follow us or add us on to your favourites with your chosen podcast provider and you'll be able to get the episodes as soon as they are available. We are also on Smart Speakers, the Fan Hub app, and we are also on YouTube. So listening to the podcast has never been easier. It certainly hasn't. If you have an older relative, a loved one, an orient chum, anyone who you think will like the podcast, somebody's thinking about season ticket next season, someone who just likes football, someone who just likes podcasts, grab their phone, grab their device, go into their house, shout out their Alexas, do anything you want, but make sure they get the pod downloaded or listened to and you pass the pod. Chris, massive thank you for joining me in Paul's absence uh, for this episode. It's not as easy as what it looks like, but I think you've been a very uh, accomplished co-host this evening. I'm sure the the people online will say if they if they didn't like it, and I'm sure. <laughs> and yeah, you'll get Paul back next week. Absolutely. And, uh, All right, the Bid legend will be back, uh, and we wish his family well over the course of the weekend at the big gathering they are having. All right, we'll be back with episode 354 next week with all the information of views that you could ever need. We look forward to hearing from you. And as always, keep calm, stay safe, have a great week, and listen to the Orient Outlook podcast.